podcasting now. Hi folks, we're just given a few seconds for um, Zoom to let people in before we get started with our introduction. Uh, if you are already logged in, you can find in the chat some information about how to purchase tonight's featured book and how to get 15% off with a special coupon code if you buy within the next week. So look in the chat to find uh, some links to that. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're excited to host tonight's event with David K. Randall presenting the paperback edition of his book, Black Death at the Golden Gate, The Race to Save America from the Bubonic Plague. He'll be talking with Dr. Celine Gounder, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now I just have a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the first thing to know is that in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. Your video and audio are turned off. Um, they can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. The exact location depends on what kind of device you're using. Uh, if you scroll towards the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a couple different functions we'll be using throughout the event. The first one is the chat. Uh, you're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in here at any point during the event. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. You'll also see at the bottom of your screen a icon labeled Q&A. Uh, if you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, you can post it in the Q&A module. Uh, we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered towards the end of the event for the Q&A portion. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Black Death at the Golden Gate, is available for sale from greenlightbookstore.com for shipping or curbside pickup. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. And as a special bonus, we're offering 15% off when you purchase the book within the next week. We'll be posting the buy link and the coupon code in the chat, so look out for those. Our interviewer for this evening is Dr. Celine Gounder. She's a practicing HIV infectious disease specialist and internist, epidemiologist, AKA disease detective, journalist, and filmmaker. She'll be speaking with our featured author, David K. Randall. He is a senior reporter at Reuters, the New York Times bestselling author of Black Death at the Golden Gate, Dreamland, and the King and Queen of Malibu. His book, Black Death at the Golden Gate, is a spine-chilling saga of virulent racism, human folly, and the ultimate triumph of scientific progress. David and Celine are going to talk with each other about the book, and then they'll be talking with all of you. Celine, David, please take it away. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thanks for inviting me, David. Oh, thanks so much for uh, having time to do this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, not at all. Um, so I, uh, as was being mentioned, I do wear a lot of hats. So some of that is as a doctor, as an epidemiologist, but also as a medical journalist. And um, in that capacity, I, I'm a CNN medical analyst as well as a podcaster. And 
I reached out to David a couple months ago now um, because he had written this book about the Black Death and I couldn't help but see certain parallels between what happened with prior epidemics, whether it was plague or Ebola more recently, and what we're facing now with the coronavirus. So I think it's you know, an interesting opportunity um, to talk to David here today about what some of those parallels are. You know, one thing I'd like to start with David is, unfortunately, we're in this moment of real anti-science, uh, science denialism. How did that manifest itself back then in San Francisco when they were dealing, contending with their own plague e epidemic at the time? That's actually one of the things that has been so almost eerie to go through this you know, last four or five months. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, to me it was just a book that seemed so far in the past and it was just a book of, you know, personalities. You know, you had one doctor whose name was Joseph Kenyon, who really represented, you know, the hard side of science, you know, really was, he was one of the most brilliant doctors at the time. He was one of the people who was really bringing modern medicine into this era of, you know, moving into the laboratory as opposed from the visceral, you know, blood and guts of being a doctor in the 19th century or so. And then, you know, he didn't, he failed in many ways. And the person who actually saved San Francisco and the country by extension from plague was Dr. Rupert Blue, who really represented, you know, the soft side of science, which was let's convince people of what we're doing, what we're doing is correct and what, we, what we're doing has merit. So that's what really drove me to the story. It just seemed like this great, really, you know, neat in the, in the you know, and not the, little kid, this is neat, but neat and like very tidy way of saying, here's how science and progress really happens. You have this push and pull between hard and soft sides of science. And that's how, you know, we tackle these big problems. Now, as you see the epidemic and it's getting worse all the time, you realize a lot of the same issues come up again. And a lot of things, if, when you look at public health, public health in many ways is diametrically opposed to democracy and, and populism because somebody has to be right. And somebody has to tell people to do something that they don't want to do. Um, and everybody has to kind of work together to save each other. You know, it's, it's a very collective idea. And when you start to see things politicized, that's when the, the problem lasts longer and it manifests itself in, in darker and darker ways. So in San Francisco at the time, um, one of the problems, you know, there are several problems, but one of them was denialism of the disease based on race. Um, there was this idea that, you know, this was a disease that only Asians can get or Asian American immigrants can get. So therefore the majority of San Francisco, which is mostly white, didn't need to worry about it. You know, there was a mistaken notion that, you know, plague was this disease of quote unquote rice eaters or, you know, people who didn't have a, a diet of beef or anything else. Um, so, you know, we, you know, many people in San Francisco at the time were in power, didn't like the Chinese, Chinese American presence in the city in the first place. So they almost didn't really care that the disease was there. Um, then as the disease spread, uh, the fight was to get people to recognize that it, that it really was there, um, that all these cases and, you know, different populations were not pneumonia, were not some other disease. They really were plague and it was really, and it was spreading. Um, then you also have the other issue, which was the economic hit, which is what we've all been talking about over the last three months. You know, this push and pull between how much do we need to protect ourselves versus how much do we need to keep an economy open so that we all can survive and, and have food and everything else. Um, for San Francisco, the big issue was, you know, this was 50 years after the gold rush. People still thought of California as this, you know, beautiful land where you could be whoever you wanted to be in perfect weather. And having plague enter that conversation just seemed like it would undercut everything that California had been building itself up to be. And you can't, no one thinks I'm going to start over in this new golden land of opportunity when it also has plague. Um, so that's something we're seeing now where you can say, you know, how the, there's it's been a very politicized question of how often do you do testing? What is the level that you say we're going to open up the economy? We're going to do a different phase. You know, I have, we have a soon to be third grader and soon to be first grader. And the question every day is what's gonna happen in the fall? You know, are we gonna have school five days a week? Are we gonna have a hybrid model? How does that work for, you know, working parents? How does that work for parents who 
you know, don't have the ability to, to watch and be with their child who's a kindergartner and, and do homeschool and remote learning. So you have all those issues that are just kind of the, the modern day uh, equivalent of what people dealt with in 1906, 1910. So if you had to draw a parallel or, you know, a modern day equivalent to Dr. Kinyoon and Dr. Blue, who in the current cast of characters would you compare them to? That's a great question. I think uh, Dr. Fauci is Dr. Blue, mostly, because you see, it's almost like he is focused so much on trust. On, um, you know, this is a person who you know, kind of looks like somebody you trust in, in some way. He, you know, he doesn't seem, he seems very, very put together, very earnest in many ways. And that's the kind of soft side of science that you need, that you need to have somebody say, I'm not in it for political gain. I'm not in it for, for anything else. Dr. Blue, it's hard to see. There's, there haven't been that many doctors have in the public conversation to the same extent. Um, I think that's one of the achievements of science over the last hundred years, is that there's much better emphasis on how do we know how we have all this knowledge and how do we communicate it. It's no longer this idea of, I know I'm, I'm right, and I'm going to speak from on high. And if you don't believe me or don't do what I say, I'm just going to become more and more draconian. You know, Ken Yoon went so far as he briefly quarantined the entire state of California um, and you know, made it impossible for anybody to, to leave the state. And it was funny, when I was writing the book, the idea of a quarantine just sounded like it was something out of science fiction. And now I've lived through one for four months. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you know, on Google, you get the Google Maps email at once in a month, like this, this is where you've traveled. And I got one today and said, I, in the last month, I've traveled three miles from my house. So <laughs> I did not expect that, you know, a year ago when, when the book came out. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot has changed in the last couple of months for all of us uh, in ways we never anticipated. Um, you know, there was a point you sort of touched on earlier, um, this idea that white residents were somehow immune from getting this. There's this exceptionalism, um, this idea that certain people are genetically, racially more predisposed to getting diseases like this. And I think we've seen a little bit of this here, especially before coronavirus really hit the U.S. Mm -hmm. I think it was this idea, this isn't going to happen to us. That's a problem of those countries yeah. for various different reasons. Um, how did that play out, if you could describe in a bit more detail, with um, the Chinese immigrants at the time and plague? So there was very much this idea that this is a giant disease of the of Asian American community, the Chinese community. Uh, so the first instinct when the first plague victim was identified in uh, 1901 was to have a, a quarantine around Chinatown itself. Um, this was pulled down after a day or two, and because it was pulled down so quickly, that almost created the idea that something else is going on here. That this is a, a con. This is, you know, some kind. There's something else. This isn't just truly based on science. Um, so you had that, and then as it went along, the whole push was, you know, we're going to clean up this part of the community, and the term cleanup became kind of a, a a whitewash for lots of other things, which was, you know, we're going to try to make these, uh, this part of the country, this part of the city, which is, you know, if you've been to San Francisco, Chinatown really is right in the heart of downtown. It's very attractive real estate. We're going to try to push to take this, you know, away, take away Chinatown, essentially. Um, there were pull, pushes and pulls to say, let's level it all, burn it all to the ground, let's make a big park, or let's do all these other things. Um, and because there wasn't this urgency of, you know, it's only a disease of immigrants, then the public health authorities in San Francisco and in California at the time didn't devote money to it. They didn't devote urgency to it. They thought this was a problem that will either sort itself out or, you know, these people deserve to, to, to have a disease because of all these other issues. You know, I, one thing I didn't realize, and you know, I grew up in California, I didn't realize how strident the anti-Asian bigotry was at the time. Um, you know, there was the, the mayor of San Francisco at the time, his name was James Fallon, and he, you know, he was strictly anti-Chinese, anti-immigrant. He ran for the U.S. Senate 
on a platform and you know saw the posters that just said keep california white and it was amazing to see like this it wasn't that long ago it was 100 years you know it's within some people's grandparents lifetime um so it's it's really as you see now too i think there was a story in the times today or maybe it was yesterday showing the racial breakdown of covid deaths and you start to see how much public health is also a reflection of all these other parts of society and it's when there's a big pandemic or a big public health crisis you get to see all the fault lines of society come out so you know, another parallel that I saw in, in reading your book was this idea at the time that the plague was fake. Uh, similarly, you know, we heard earlier on that coronavirus was just a flu, it was a hoax. Uh, back during Ebola, we heard Ebola is not real, it's a hoax, you know, on the ground in West Africa. Where did that idea come from? You know, why do people say epidemic infectious diseases like this are not real? I think part of it is just because they don't want it to be. You know, it's, they don't want to have to face the reality of whatever it is, whether it's because it's going to be an economic hit, uh, whether they just don't want to realize that they don't have control over something. Um, I think that's one issue we don't see it today. I mean, we see it today where so long, you know, part of this crisis was you know, it's, it's a Chinese disease, or it's only a problem of Europe. Oh, it's only a problem of New York. We shouldn't close the entire country down for New York. And now you're seeing, you know, Arizona having the huge spikes and in cases in Florida and Idaho and all these other places. I think it's very hard, especially when it's something that you can't necessarily see, mm -hmm. to say this is a problem until it really hits me or hits somebody I know. Um, you know, living through New in New York area over the last four months, it's very hard not to know people. You know, I. I know people who have died. I know people's mothers and fathers who have died from this. Um, it's very, once you start to have that kind of personal connection to it, it makes, you have a face on it. You can see that this is something that is, it, it can, it's going to come for you. It's going to come to your area, whether you want it or not. Um, and that's one thing I've been really struck by, by the, the pandemic so far. It always seems like these, these three months waves. You know, it was three months in China, then it was Italy, and now it's New York, and now three months later, it's, it's the rest of the country. Um, and it's, it seems like that pattern will continue until, I think it's very hard for people to say preemptively, I'm gonna do something, whether it's socially distance or wear masks, when I don't feel that threat is, is close to me. You know, I, that's one question I had for, you know, for you and your date, when you were working on the front lines of this every day, how are you seeing patients or, you know, families, how has it changed for you over the last three months? I think what was really striking was how quickly people went from they seem stable to critically ill and needing to be on a ventilator. I mean, it happened just like that for some people where you would see them, you'd round on them in the morning, they seem fine. And then a couple hours later, we were calling a code blue overhead. I think that was, that was startling because usually you get a little bit more of a sense that somebody's headed in the wrong direction. Um, and so, you know, that was pretty interesting. I think the other thing was that, um, at least where I was practicing at Bellevue Hospital, which is the, the big, call it county hospital for New York City, um, we had a lot of undocumented immigrants or other Latino uh, per persons of Latinx descent. Um, and I think that's probably a reflection of Bellevue's catchment area and who's ending up there versus, say, hospitals like Elmhurst, which may have been a bit more African-American relative to Bellevue or you know, Lincoln Hospital or Bronx, Lebanon, et cetera. But um, we also had a lot of younger people. Um, we had, and mostly they were obese, may not have known they had high blood pressure, may not have known they had diabetes, didn't really realize they were at risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that, um, especially knowing that the rates of obesity in the South in particular are higher than elsewhere in the country, just because you're young does not mean you're not at risk for this. So I, I would say those were two of, from a clinical perspective, the two big takeaways, I would say. Do you feel like you've kind of crested the wave? Does it seem like you're, do you still feel like you're on war footing or do you feel like this is, you know, as normal as a hospital can be? So in New York, we have definitely crushed the curve, uh, not flattened it, we crushed it. Um, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so there's some great lessons there in terms of how do you handle this for the rest of the country. Um, 
you know, we have very, very few new hospital admissions for COVID right now. Most of the patients who are in the hospital for COVID have been there for a couple months, some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so people that came in March, April, May, June uh, may still be there. Um, and, you know, I think that's another thing people don't realize is how long the recovery can take. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to have a second wave in New York in the fall. We're all kind of bracing for that. And I think in following the headlines in terms of what I'm worried about for myself right now is that we are seeing shortages of personal protective equipment in other parts of the country. And that means that when our second wave hits, we may be running into those shortages again. Um, you know, and so that has me worried right now. That's one thing, you know, I'm 99% sure I had COVID in early March and, you know, it wasn't, it never, was far enough to be, you know, hospitalization of, you know, 10 is death and five is hospitalization. I was like a four, you know, I was okay. But even then I went from being able to play basketball fine for an hour to running, to, to not being able to walk upstairs without losing my breath. And that took a month and a half to, to get over, you know, even now I still feel out of breath much easier than I ever did before. And, you know, I'm not in the demographic where you'd say this is you know, the most dangerous, you're most likely to have a dangerous outcome, or a deadly outcome from this disease. And that's one thing, you know, I, when you look back at the plague too, you, the idea of who, who can get the disease or who's the most likely to die from the disease, I think that part of the public narrative is forged very quickly and it's hard for people to, to change that thought. They, they anchor in that idea very quickly. And I don't, I don't know if that's the same experience for you. Do you feel like the patients you work with thought that they could have, you know, was it a surprise? Did they think that they were free? They're, you know, scot free because they were younger? Uh, you know, I, I think there was definitely some surprise thinking that they wouldn't get this sick, that it wasn't this bad of a disease. I think you see this with other diseases too, like HIV. I think people like actually prefer to think about it as a disease of certain people because it makes them feel invincible and, you know, that this isn't going to happen to me. Um, so I do think you see that with other diseases. Um, you know, sort of to that point, I'm curious. So, and this comes back to Dr. Blue again. So the plague hits San Francisco again. Mm -hmm. um, and this time I think it was more with, was it San Francisco? Or, no, it was Los Angeles, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then at that time, it's more uh, Me Mexican and other Latinx workers who are hit. Mm -hmm. um, how did, you know, I, I think it was the LA Times that um, in their coverage also kind of fell into this same pattern. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So this was 1924 and Blue had gone on from San Francisco to, he was the Surgeon General and he was the Surgeon General during the Great Flu outbreak in 1918. And also, you know, in, in any way, that was a failure. In many, and he eventually had to step down from sort of working as a Surgeon General. He remained in the public health service. And essentially, it was close to retirement, but he came out of retirement when play reared its head again in, in Los Angeles. Um, so he goes back to, to essentially save the country one more time. And many of the same things that happened 20 years earlier in San Francisco repeated themselves. And it was very quickly uh, characterized as a racial disease. It was a racial lens, a class lens was put on the disease very, very quickly. Um, the LA Times, you know, kind of an, an echo of the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, didn't call it plague for a while. They, you know, they kept on referring it to the New Mexican pneumonia. Um, and you had businesses across the city who started firing, you know, Mexican and Latino workers just because of the association, even though, you know, they could have lived you know, LA is a sprawling place. It's, you know, 50 miles from one side of, you know, what really is considered LA to the other. Um, there's no chance, there's no chance of transmission that quickly. Um, but you saw, it was very quickly, you know, you're in this demographic. So therefore, I'm, I'm scared. And, you know, I'm, I'm fearful of you. Um, and I think you saw some of that here, not in terms of, you know, this is, you know, this race or this person, so therefore I'm scared you have it. But I almost thought it was a, almost for a while, it was a geographic issue that you're from New York or you're from New Jersey, you know, starting three months ago, you know, we're not going to let you in this other state. Or, you know, you heard stories of, you know, people in Maine, you know, 
pulling, like, kind of chasing down people that a New York played or a New Jersey played to see where they'd been, for, where, where they'd um, come from. Um, and I think you, you started seeing that kind of country turning against itself very quickly because a disease scares people so much. And it kind of is one of those things that's a very visceral fear. Um, and with plague, it was you know, one of the most visceral fears. It's one of the oldest diseases we know of and you know, one of the, the scariest. You know, it's from the time you're bit by a, a flea, which uh, transmits plague, by the time you die, it's you know, 48, 72 hours. And that's even even today. So you know, if you don't have antibiotics quickly, that that's a very quickly that's a very quick quick uh, you know, quick death. Mm -hmm. I mean, another common refrain you could say um, with these outbreaks as well as others is this xenophobia, this anti-Chinese sentiment. I mean, we've heard about the Wuhan virus, the China mm -hmm. virus, the China flu. Um, and there was certainly an anti-Chinese xenophobic um, element to how the plague in San Francisco played out. Did you, were there similar uh, anti-Chinese sentiments expressed around other infectious diseases or was it, is this really unique to these two? It, it was basically one more thing to put into the bucket of reasons why there was you know, anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, there were also um, it, there were issues at the time too with you know smallpox with other diseases, and it was just at the cusp of when there started to be you know widespread vaccinations and inoculations. So there was this mistrust of science overall. Um, so anytime there was a almost like an excuse to say this is an immigrant's fault, this is the other's fault, people jumped at it. Um, and California at the time too really did have a stratified community and society that, you know, Chinese laborers, Chinese immigrant laborers who came to California from the get-go did some of the most dangerous jobs. You know, the, the Transcontinental Railroad was built with Chinese labor. Um, you know, many of the hardest jobs in the gold mines and the you know, gold rush were, were done with Chinese labor. And it was this fight at the time to say, you know, who, who belongs here? And when there's, an out, when there's some kind of crisis, there is an inclination for people to kind of huddle back with who they think their tribe is. And when you have a, you know, multi, you know, multiracial, multi, you know, a society that has a broad range of class, classes, you're going to start seeing those, those tensions arise. And, you know, who is in power and who is in control at a time when it feels like no one is control, is in control. And there were, there were also attempts um, to close borders. I think it was more state borders in this context, right? Yeah, so you had states uh, and, you know, public health uh, officers and states like Texas, Louisiana, saying, you know, we're not going to let anyone travel to our state without, um, doc from California, unless there's some documentation that they do not have this disease. Um, you started seeing places like Arizona and Texas, um, you know, grocery stores having signs outside saying, we don't sell California fruits or vegetables. Um, and that was, you know, that's, that was the big hit to California at the time. It's, you know, California, if you're not from California, many people think of it as, you know, Hollywood or San Francisco. Agriculture is a huge part of its, of its economy. You know, the, the Central Valley grows most of this country's food. Um, so that was a, a huge hit. And I think that's the big, one thing I didn't realize when I was writing the book, you know, you, you followed what the facts were and you, you try to, you know, follow the same themes and what was happening. I guess I didn't, I realize now in a better, I have a better appreciation for how much the economy and economic concerns can inform medical concerns. You know, you like to think that we're all rational people and we're gonna say, you know, medicine and health comes before the economy. But as you can see over the last four, three or four months, it's not that simple in many ways. Well, similarly to the way we've seen um, the coronavirus uh, transmission, uh, cases, deaths in the U.S. being downplayed currently, uh, leaders at the time did something similar, I think including San Francisco's mayor, right? Exactly. They, they didn't want to, first of all, they didn't want to count the, the bodies. They didn't want to um, have widespread testing. Um, there, there was a big fight at the time over whether the truth of whether plague was there or not. Um, you know, it, was, it wasn't 
spreading as quickly as places like Hong Kong and India were to just decimate the population. And in the book, I explain why that it, the disease didn't transmit as quickly, even though it was there. So they ended up having to bring in experts, um, you know, a panel of experts whose whole push was to say, we're going to definitively prove once and for all whether plague is here or not. Um, and you started to see, you know, the parallels to now was, you know, if you look back in February and March to say, is, is, is this coronavirus or not, you know, or is this the flu or, you know, is, you know, COVID really that scary of a disease? You know, the whole thing of, it's just the bad flu, you know, and, and look at the death rate, not the number of people who have it. Those are all, those all issues kind of seem like a, you know, 21st century echo of, you know, the fight in San Francisco over you know, the truth of whether the disease, whether the disease is there and how, how much that matters, you know, whether life can go on or not. So during this pandemic, the people who have suffered most in terms of cases have been frontline and essential workers. They've also, many of them have been among those who've suffered most economically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, restaurant industry, for example, has been one of the hardest hit. Um, at that time, who were the groups that really suffered the economic consequences of the plague outbreak? It was the exact same. So it was Chinese American workers. Um, they're the ones who are working in laundries, who are working in restaurants, who are working as you know, laborers. Um, and as it spread, once it spread outside of the Chinese community, it really did spread to the working class, of, you know, Latino working class, Italian immigrants, Portuguese immigrants. Um, at the time, what that's now considered uh, San Francisco's North Beach neighborhood was called the Latin Quarter. And that really does abut Chinatown. And you know, plague is spread by fleas on rats. And as the rats migrated to the city, the fleas migrated to the city. And as they moved, so did the disease with them. Um, so it was the people who were most likely to come in contact with rats and fleas. And those people tended to be farther down the economic ladder. Um, one person who, you know, I detailed who's, who died in the book, <coughs> he actually uh, picked up some furniture that had been thrown out of a uh, of someone's apartment who actually died from plague. Um, he picked it up and thought, hey, this is, I'm going to use this as fuel, you know, put it in my fireplace at home to keep my, to warm up my family. Um, as he was carrying it back, the fleas went all over his body, um, and he was dead within, you know, three days. Um, it was the same thing where a, uh, a, a family of people who the man worked as a mortician. Uh, you know, his kids saw him doing his day job. They found a rat in their basement. They decided to like, let's make a, a mock funeral for it. The rats, you know, got all over themselves the, and they killed the whole family. So you started seeing these, you know, the, the, the intersection of where people's jobs and their daily lives come in, that's where the chance, the largest chance was of uh, catching the disease. So we saw a lot of, or we are seeing a lot of pushback in many parts of the country about various different public health measures. Some, you know, the stricter shelter in place measures, even wearing masks, we're seeing pushback. Um, you mentioned quarantines earlier. What kind of pushback was there against public health measures to address the plague? So it was similar in the fact that there was denial right away. Um, what you saw was, you know, from, there was the governor of California, um, you know, would go around telling everybody that it's all a, a hoax, it's, you know, it's not true. Um, a state senator on the floor in Sacramento said that Kenyon should be hung for what he was doing to the state. Um, there were, you know, mobs of people who attacked Kenyon who didn't want to, he, they thought that he embodied all of this idea that, you know, this fake disease is here and he's just trying to spread lies about us and he's going to hurt all of, all of us. Um, so you started seeing that. Um, you started seeing the newspapers refusing to cover it. Um, or if they did, it was incredibly slanted saying, you know, who would believe such things? Uh, you had the governor of California starting calling Kenyon, you know, in an echo of today, calling Kenyon names. You know, he would say, call nicknames. This is suspicious Kenyon or lying Kenyon. And that's very similar to public figures today who, you know, are focusing on someone they, they 
if we're telling the truth that they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So looking back at <coughs> the study of, um, you know, the bubonic plague in San Francisco, what are some of the key lessons for us today? You know, what are, what are some of the mistakes we're repeating and, and what can we learn from that prior history? I think one of the best things we can learn is that we have to focus almost more on the soft side of science, especially in the initial part of the outbreak than you do on the hard part, even though the hard part is what's gonna save more lives in the short term. So fo focusing on the soft part, getting people to trust you and to make them feel like you are an honest broker, that this is not politicized in any way, that's what's gonna save more lives over the long run. And I think that was one of the mistakes um, they made in San Francisco. I think today we did a slightly better job, but I think there, there was the mistake now of it's become a political issue of, you know, whether you have a mask on or not, um, you know, whether you are quarantining yourself or not. Um, it almost becomes, uh, you know, tribalism. Like, I live in a place where, you know, I either believe all of this or I live in a place where I don't. And I have to show my affiliation through whether I have a mask on my face or not, or whether I'm going on vacation or whether I'm doing anything else. I think it was also one of the first times in San Francisco, at least, that you had to have collective action to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to do that today still. And, you know, the disease will continue to spread if there is not collective action. It's not something one person can do on, by themselves. If you look at areas of the world that have had, that have really, you know, not only flattened the curve, but eliminated the curve with New Zealand or other places, it has become, been because it's a widespread thought of we're all in this together. And I, maybe it's because it's an election year, maybe it's because of, you know, lots of things, but it seems like that is one of the things that's really holding the U.S. back. Was the plague a partisan issue back then? It was and it wasn't. It was more of a us versus them issue. So you had, in San Francisco itself, it was a partisan issue. You had some parts of the country, parts of the city, you know, Democrats, who wanted to uh, put more money into public health, and you had Republicans who did not and said this was just a big hoax. Once the disease did spread, it became a California versus the rest of the, or San Francisco in particular, against the rest of the country issue. It was, you know, you started even seeing San Francisco newspapers refusing to cover any news about it. And then you have someone in St. Louis or somewhere in Chicago who would actually know more about the death toll and the rate of increase of the disease in San Francisco than somebody living there themselves. Um, so you had that, you know, Un, in, unbalance, this imbalance of information. And I think you have that today now too, that it's, you know, if you've lived through New York or New Jersey, a place where you really had a crisis, you know a lot more, you're just much more familiar with it than maybe somebody who lives in a different part of the country where they thought, you know, why they shut schools down, they shut everything down, and I don't even know anybody with the disease, why did I do that? And it was all, why, you know, why should I, why did I put myself through that? Do you think people have to bear witness themselves in person to really be convinced of the necessity to do these things? I think so, um, sadly. That I think that goes back to the kind of the soft part of science that you don't want to, it's a hard balance to, to do because you don't want to, um, you don't want to use somebody else's pain and suffering as a billboard or an example but sometimes that's what you need. So it's how, that's a very fine line of saying, you know, I don't want to abuse this person who is going through, you know, who's lost their family member or is gonna die themselves. But at the same time, people need to go see it for themselves to realize this is real. Um, and I think that's a, a hard balance that's, that we haven't really figured out yet. Yeah. You know, and, and it's almost as if like face masks have become your way of flying your flag in this exactly. moment, you know, was there, was there something that rose to that level, that kind of symbol at the time? Well, not, not exactly the same. What did benefit them at San Francisco at the time was Rupert Blue was the first one to realize that it's the fleas on the rats that, that spread plague. And he had the innovative idea of 
let's pay people to kill as many rats as possible. So, you know, he literally, people would show up to bring dead rats to their office and they'd pay people a quarter for each one or, or 50 cents if it was a, a female rat. Um, so you had, you know, gangs of kids going through, the, going through the city, killing as many rats as possible. And Blue spoke to any organization that would have him. You know, he spoke to business elite like Levi Strauss. He would speak to the league, you know, the, um, the league of you know, uh, women voters, or it wasn't voters at the time, but, you know, civics leagues, um, longshoremen, anybody, you know, uh, anywhere who would, who would have him there. He used to talk to them about the, big, the biggest civic duty you can do is to kill as many rats as you can see. And it gave somebody something to do. You know, it was almost like this is a proactive idea that you can, you know, not only save yourself, but save others. And I think a face mask is hard because it's not as proactive. It's, it's something you can do. You can wear a mask, but it doesn't, have, it doesn't have that same visceral reaction of, you know, I stamped something out and I have some evidence of that I helped. And I think that if there was some way we could show somebody that they're helping, that would make this whole situation a lot easier and probably make it go by faster too. So I'm gonna um, open it up to Q&A now. One of the questions we've already sort of answered um, about what are some of the lessons learned, but to follow up on that discussion, um, I mean, you, you said that it's many of the same groups, populations, that found themselves um, at risk for the disease, at risk for the economic impact. Um, what could we be doing? You know, clearly we haven't really learned some of those lessons because those people remain vulnerable in that way. What are the, some of the things that we could be doing to address that vulnerability? That's a great question. I think it's going to be a, a matter of public health education. Um, it's a matter of looking at the structural changes that we need to make to our society. And I think that's a conversation that, you know, we as a country have been having over the last three or four months is starting to look at what are the structural issues that underpin many of the issues and the problems that we're facing, whether it's racism, whether it's, you know, focused on immigration, whether it's tying uh, healthcare to education or to employment in many ways, those are the things that we're going to need to address, um, at, as well as just a, kind of breaking through the noise to show that, you know, essentially science is real. And these are issues that really can save someone's lives, someone's life. And this is something very easy to do. That's one thing I was really struck by with the plague was Dr. Rupert Blue, many of the innovations he did, it was part of what was then known as the Great Sanitary Awakening. And he essentially made cities livable. He, you know, he started doing things such as instituting street sweeping or instituting rat, -proof, rat proofing trash cans or ripping up wooden sidewalks and putting concrete there so that rats can't nest and burrow underneath. And they all seem so common sense to us now, but they were so radical back then. You know, this idea that you would, why would someone street, clean up the street like that? You know, San Francisco was notorious for people just throwing out uh, food or whatever else into the street or having the carcasses of horses or anything else there. I think, you know, 100 years from now, people might look back and say, it was so easy just to put a mask on. It was so easy just to put some gloves on your hands before you went out. I think that's, that's the hard, that's the biggest thing we're going to need to focus on. Well, and you mentioned the restaurant industry back then, you mentioned agriculture back then. Those are still some of the most vulnerable industries today. Exactly. It's, it's one of those things that as much as things change, that they, they stay the same in many ways. It's the people who are most likely on the front lines are going to be people who, you know, typically minorities, typically people who are in working class jobs. And having that ability to, to save those people who are most in need is going to save everybody. So another question from the audience, is the bubonic plague a threat to the United States in the 21st century? It's still around. Um, one of the failures of Blue and everything else was he saved the city and he saved the vast population. Um, he did not stop plague from spreading in the country though. Uh, it became endemic in the rodent population and the, the West. 
So even now, if you go to Yosemite, if you go to places in Idaho, there are signs saying, you know, beware of disease squirrels because they can carry plague. Um, about, you know, 15 to 20 cases, um, human cases of plague are identified in the U.S. every year. Um, it's more of a problem among the prairie dogs and New Mexico um, veterinarians in California, New Mexico, other places, they're trained to identify plague um, because they're more, you know, animals are more likely to get by, get by, bit by fleas. And that is the crucial juncture so that they, can, they don't jump into the human population. Um, what we have now is antibiotics can cure plague. Um, they, did, they could not before. But the biggest issue is the fact that you need a dose of antibiotics very quickly um, it's a very, because it's a very fast disease. Yeah, I mean, I, I've actually practiced on um, Indian reservations in the southwest of Mexico and Arizona, and that's exactly the, it's the prairie dog exposure in that part of the country, and it's really a question of how quickly you as the provider seeing the patient, do you think about it? Do you, does it occur to you that the patient has this? Because there are actually very basic antibiotics that work against the plague, very old antibiotics that work. It's just you need to think to give it to them, um, which is often more, more the challenge. That's one thing um, I, was, I noticed while writing about the plague in San Francisco, the outbreak, was that it took for a while for doctors who treated mostly white patients to say, you know, I never even thought to look to, to think this was plague. I just thought this was pneumonia. I didn't think white people could get this disease. Um, so kind of educating the doctors as well is, is, is such a big issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's funny, but back in... Uh... <laughs> January, um, I was on the wards for two weeks of January with my residents and med students and, you know, had already been reading the reports out of China at that point and so had been pulling, you know, the papers from the New England Journal of Medicine and so on and reviewing them with the residents. And they were kind of rolling their eyes at me like, oh, this is never going to happen here. We're not, we don't, why do we have to learn this? You know, and within like a few weeks, clearly <laughs> it was a very different story. We were swamped with those patients. But um, it is interesting how, you know, do you think that this, th these things can happen to you? Do you bother to learn about them? Um, you know, what's your index of suspicion and how prepared are you? It, it seems like one of those issues too with San Francisco and the plague kind of showed it was the first era of globalization that, you know, people could travel around the world fast enough to spread a disease like that so quickly. Now it seems like we're in a world that's so interconnected that if there's a disease anywhere, essentially it's everywhere. You know, it's, it's hard not to say that it's, it's very easy to travel from China or from Italy or wherever else. And I think there's certain times that most of the diseases, most of the COVID cases in New York could be traced to Italy, not China. It kind of seems that's, you know, the disease is gonna come. It just might not come in the way you think it's gonna come. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think that's a great point. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons it's really important that places like New York City have contact tracing now because just because it was in nursing homes or, you know, among certain first uh, essential workers in the beginning doesn't mean that's how it's going to rear its head again come this fall. So it's really important to sort of be thinking about where else it might manifest itself. So I think that's all the questions we have from the audience. Is there anything else you wanted to say, David, before we close? No, I... Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time and thank you so much for your work and you know, saving people every day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, stay safe, be well, and please wear your mask. Yeah, thank you, thank you uh, so much, Celine and David, for this wonderful, informative, enlightening conversation. Um, and thank you, Celine, for your work on the front lines here in New York. A reminder to everyone that tonight's event has been recorded, so if you had to miss any part of it or you have friends or family who missed it, uh, it'll be up on our YouTube channel tomorrow, Greenlight Bookstore, and keep an eye out on our social channels as well. And a reminder that you can buy David's book through greenlightbookstore.com for shipping or curbside pickup. Uh, you can find that link at the chat or on greenlightbookstore.com, and you can also get 15% off before July 16th with code RANDALL. Uh, thanks so much again, everyone, for coming out and taking the time to share this virtual space with us tonight, and have a great rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.